Hello there and welcome to our L24 special coverage over the Ukraine-Russia war, the so-called special military operation. The White House on Tuesday doubled down on its proclamation that Russia will try to annex additional Ukrainian territory, warning that Moscow intends to claim as its own large swath of the country's east and south sometimes later this year. Russia is beginning to roll out a version of what you could call an annexation playbook said National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, citing what he called ample evidence gathered by Western intelligence and already in the public domain, indicating that President Vladimir Putin wants to take Kherson, Zaporizhia, and Donbass region in direct violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. On the other side, Gazprom has signed a major agreement in Iran, even as the Russian company says it cannot guarantee gas supplies to Europe. The agreement will involve billions of dollars, according to Iranian media, and it will come despite sanctions on Russia and Iran. The company has declared force measure, which enables it to cut supplies during extreme conditions. This means, even as Gazprom is at the center of controversy in Europe, it is making deals in Iran. To analyze all this information, I'm joined live by Mr. Mirko Giordani, founder and CEO of Prelia Strategic Intelligence and Political Risk Consultancy, and Mrs. Ionela Maria, policy analyst and researcher on EU foreign policy from Belgium. Gentlemen, madam, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to this debate. The discussion begins right after this break. And before we delve into our discussion, ladies and gentlemen, let me read for you this uh, piece of information. The head of the, the regional military administration said that three people were killed in the northern Ukraine city on Wednesday. This comes as Ukrainian forces have struck and seriously damaged a bridge that is key for supplying Russian troops in southern Ukraine. Starting with you, Mrs. Ayunula, since you are in Brussels, where top agenda meetings always take place, I will start, I'll be starting with you. Well, looking to the, the battlegrounds map, it is clearly seen that the main focus of uh, the clash in Ukraine now is in the eastern part of the country. And Russia is also putting more power over the southern side as well. Russian troops are claiming taking a full control of the old regions over there. But Ukraine, on the other side, keep denying. So... What is close to be true? Which narrative is, should be believed? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be with you from, from Brussels. So how I see the things? We are now in a stage of war of attrition uh, between the Ukrainians and the Russians. And we saw that in the past two months, the Russians didn't uh, succeed to conquer massive territory. So uh, they are trying to uh, shell more uh, cities on the uh, battlefront. And uh, in this regard, we see also the shilling in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is the um, uh, second biggest city in Ukraine, and it's very important for the Ukrainian economy. And also the city is 50 kilometers away uh, to the Russian border. And we also know that uh, President Putin, a um, couple of days ago, basically uh, have ordered the Russian forces to seize the Kharkiv city and the rest of the unoccupied Kharkiv oblast. Um, even though probably uh, this will be extremely improbable uh, due to the fact that Ukrainians have these highly modernized uh, weapons which they receive from the West. But what we are seeing these days is that the Russians are intensifying the ground of assault attempts on the Kharkiv city 
without any respect for human lives. Mm -hmm. Perfect, quite understood. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Giordani, don't you think now the war is taking another phase? It's the war of the whole continent in Europe and other countries might and must join to this war. What are you saying about this? No, sincerely, I don't think that other countries will join this war. This is, uh, this is you know, a, a world war when we speak about sanctions and we speak about mobili mobilization at international level. It remains a local war for the people that actually <clears throat> die on the field. Okay, uh, the other powers do not dare to put their feet into Ukraine. We have, obviously, it's an old story <clears throat> that no European country has tried to do something to put a soldier in the in Ukraine. Not NATO for sure. Um, there is. Uh, there was discussions about uh, Hungary maybe occupying uh, the border of Ukraine with Hungary in case the situation in Ukraine becomes so worse. But this is obviously a scenario that we will not see, okay? <clears throat> so I frankly believe it's uh, quite impossible that we will see now in the next future involvement of other powers fighting in Ukraine. Quite uh, understood. Now moving on to the second uh, point to be discussed. Ukraine's parliament dismissed the domestic security chief and prosecutor general on Tuesday, two days after President Vladimir Zelensky suspended them from uh, failing to root out Russian spies. The head of Zelensky's political faction said that Irina Vandiktova had also been voted out as a prosecutor general who played a key role in the prosecution of Russian war crimes. 651 criminal proceedings have been registered for treason of the state and collaboration activities by employees of prosecutors' offices, judicial institutions and other law enforcement agencies in the case of 198 criminal proceedings. Uh, same with you, Mr. Giordani. In time of war, it's preferable not to put pressure and accusation over deputies. Why now, after almost six months, Zelensky take this move? And he also said that Prime Minister would be tasked with intensifying the search for a new head of National Anti-Corruption Bureau. I, I don't think that it's correct to say that during a crisis you can't open a crisis, that during a war you can't open a, a crisis. We have noticed, for example, how Churchill uh, uh, take the place of Chamberlain during the Second World War. So it's... Uh, it's absolutely normal that there is uh, political changes during uh, times of crisis, for example, wars. Uh, I believe that Zelensky made a big mistake due to his uh, um, politic, due to his lack of political uh, um, experience when he was elected. You know, he was uh, an actor. He was a comic actor, and uh, he didn't really choose uh, the. Uh, public servants based on their experience, he chose them based on their personal friendship. For example, the head of the, of the Secret Service was a personal and old friend of Zelensky. Like, is it possible that uh, the head of a state like Ukraine is choosing uh, the head of the Secret Service based on his relationship when he was in the elementary school? So this is... Uh, this was a big mistake made by Zelensky, which has paid. Um, you have to choose your public servant based on their CV, based on their skills, not on the political allegiance, not on the friendship, not, not on the personal friendship, which is even worse. If it is, you know, political allegiance, maybe it's understandable. But if you are choosing political servants, if you are choosing public servant, given their friendship with you, you are going to pay the price for that. So I believe that Zelensky understood it. I believe that Zelensky, if he has made what he has made, he had his reasons. Um, there, are, there are accusations that they have cooperated with Russians, which is treason. Mm -hmm. And in most of the time uh, during war, there is the martial law for that. Mm -hmm. So... I believe that Zelensky 
took a great decision in doing it. He demonstrated to be brave um, and that he's capable of changing top public servants even during crisis. And he has changed the, the public prosecutor, which is, you know, um, accusing Russians of war crimes, which is even a bolder move to do in, during this period. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Mrs. Ionella, uh, do you think that President Zelensky is the man of the period in Ukraine, even after this, uh, any, this lack of uh, the, the responsibility? And he kind of, he was accused that he was the responsible to take Ukraine into this war. What are you saying about this? Uh, I, I personally consider that President Zelensky basically is the man who is uh, portraying the Ukrainian resistance and resolve in fighting for their country, for the country's sovereignty, independence, and even identity. Because we know that President uh, um, Putin last year in a commentary, he wrote that there isn't such a thing as Ukrainian identity. And there are a lot of proofs nowadays that Russia is uh, fighting a war against the Ukrainian uh, nationhood and even the existence of Ukrainians as a separate nation. Um, so I, I feel like President um, Zelensky, yes, maybe he did some mistakes, but we have to keep in mind that uh, on one way he didn't have previous political or leadership experiences um, on the second uh, one, it's very hard to lead the country uh, within a war period, and he's doing his best. And from what we saw here uh, from Brussels, he's doing actually an excellent job. Mm -hmm. Understood. Now, let's talk on another point, which is really important. EU foreign ministers signed off 5 billion million more military aid for Ukraine as a top EU diplomat Joseph Borrell stressed the effectiveness of sanctions on Russia on Monday. The aid decision came after a video debriefing on the latest development by Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuliba, who said that he was grateful for the new funds, which brings the EU total to 2.5 billion euros, but still urged the 27 nations to provide more. Russia is trying to destroy Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation and at the same time unleashing a global food and energy crisis. The ministers were unanimously agreeing on the need to continue to stand firmly with Ukraine and to lend Ukraine with all our support in its fight for freedom and independence. Ukraine needs more arms. We will provide them. This is Ayunella. I'm, I'm coming with you because it's always in Brussels. Uh, Europe now is living, I don't know, a kind of a different situation. Don't you really think that the war in Ukraine is really helpful for Europe more than any other continent? And U.S. on the other side is only pushing the escalation forward as the war serves its cause, which is. Uh, creating a united front against military rival Russia, and secondly, to weaken the EU economy, which is also a competitor to US economy. Two birds with one stone. This is why they want the war to go as long they, as they want, and this is why they keep using this suicidal policy of sanctions. It hurts only European uh, continent. Actually, this is not true. I, I feel that the, uh, the sanctions is hurting the Russians. Uh, there are some global consequences and uh, European consequences on the fact that we see this uh, growing inflation. Uh, but this inflation and the rises in gas and petrol prices, um, it's due to the fact that President Putin is uh, instrumentalizing and uh, transforming uh, the, the uh, trade, the gas trade, into an economic war against the European Union. I feel like the, this is a small price that the European continent pays for its uh, um, safety and security and for its principles, because we have to keep in mind that uh, there is the main principle of the uh, country it's a sovereign country, Ukraine is a sovereign country, and it has the right to exist. And Russia is an aggressor who uh, 
violated the international treaty. And this brings a very dangerous precedent around the world. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that uh, Washington is somehow pushing the Europeans uh, to do all the sanctions. I am a strong believer in the fact that we have a transatlantic dialogue and cooperation, and uh, all these sanctions are taking into account all interests of both parts of the Atlantic. And in, in this regard, I, I feel that even Europeans are the ones who are motivated to support Ukraine in uh, fighting against the Russian aggression, because especially in Central Eastern Europe, we know already from our previous history with Russia that the Russian will not stop at Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Perfectly answered. Mr. Giordani, Putin stated that he's not taking the period of this military operation into consideration. I mean, he's not worried about the time it might take. He said that we are ready in all fields to take as long as they want. Most important, we will reach our goal, which is to have a full control of the Donbass region and end the Ukrainian threat and its Nazism. Don't you think that this, this is a very wise word in terms of strategic politics? to show his enemies that I am winning the war and I don't care about your future sanctions and at the same time to let his soldiers and even Russian citizens feel comfortable over their lives and their future. Uh, great powers thinks in that way. Uh, I am taking my time, it will be long term, but in, but in the end I am doing it. Great powers usually put political beliefs above economic beliefs. So Russians and Russian leadership, everyone believes that Russian leadership are fragmented. Russian leadership is absolutely cemented around this man, around Putin. That Putin will finish, yes, but nowadays during this war, Russian leadership is absolutely cemented around its leader. And most of the Russians are together with Putin. This is the, we, we have to understand that in the West, you know, like we, we have to speak about Russians thinking like a Russian. We need to understand Russians. And uh, um, what the other guest was saying before, I partially disagree. Um, on, the, on the fact that uh, Russians will go, will continue to push despite the sanctions. Russians uh, uh, are not really feeling the sanctions now. They will feel in the future, but not now. And the European countries and Western countries must start to think about what the sanctions are useful for. What was the target? What was the goal of the sanction? The goal of the sanctions were to stop Putin, were to stop Russians from invading Ukraine, yes or no? Because if the target was to stop Russians from invading Ukraine, they have failed. So it means that these sanctions are not stopping Russians from attacking Ukraine. They are using other ways to sell their oil. India is buying their oil. China is buying their oil. Now there is this agreement with Iran. The fact is that Russia is not isolated. Like we need to think in this way. It's not because we Western countries are saying that Russia is isolated, so Russia is isolated. No, Russia is not. I, I want to say more. Russia is less isolated even in the West. We have noticed that with the turbines of Siemens, which is rushing away from Canada to Germany to Russia. Okay, so I don't. I have always said here in this uh, in this TV show that I stand with with Ukraine. I don't have to say it anymore. But we analysts, we have to be very pragmatic. We have to say. Are these sanctions working? No, they are not working in stopping Russians from invading Ukraine. Do we have other ways to stop Russians in Ukraine? Yes. Who is doing the best job in doing that? Erdogan. Like, do, do we understand that Very we good. have a NATO member, which is Turkey, which is playing in two, in two tables? Two tables? This is diplomacy. This is diplomacy. Turkey, which is playing both with NATO and the West, but 
it is also playing with Iran and Russia, Perfect. trying to be the trade union. Like this is the thing we need to understand that Russia it's not isolated and that this war will go as much as Russia wants. This is the fact. Thank you ever so much for the points you have raised. It's very important. Coming to you, Mrs. Uh, Ionella, do you agree with what uh, uh, Mr. Giordani has just said? Russia is not isolated, as clearly seen. They have influence all over the world and they have allies all over the world and they are strong, wealthy. So the sanctions right now are not at all helpful for Russia. And you can see that Euro kind of is less than a dollar right now. And on the other side, ruble is uh, moving ahead. So do you think that the EU and the NATO countries, led by US as always uh, uh, Putin claim, will keep moving with the suicidal sanctions policy? Do you think it will be helpful? Uh, we have to uh, keep in mind the fact that the sanctions, and usually sanctions don't show results on the next day. It, it takes some time. Uh, the fact that the rubble uh, and uh, all this um, uh, influx of foreign currency from the uh, trade of oil and gas uh, strengthened the rubble, it doesn't mean that it strengthened the Russian economy because the Russian economy is also dependent and interdependent from other elements which they previously took or cooperated with uh, American, Western or European companies. And in this regard, probably we'll see the decline of the Russian economy in the upcoming years. Let's take a step back and look at how the sanctions worked after um, they were imposed first after the Russian annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014. And we saw the fact that there was a high inflation in Russia. We saw the fact uh, that the living, the standard of living for people in Russia decreased. We saw uh, the fact oh, that okay. the Russian economy is not competitive anymore. So, okay, uh, uh, President Putin is trying to create uh, alternative markets. But in order to sell to Iran, to China, to India, it has to construct those pipelines. And at the moment, we don't have them. And basically, we take a couple of years. That's why we see nowadays that even President Putin, through his actions, it shows that he is aware of the fact that uh, the Russian economy is dependent on the money which are coming mostly from the European um, so we have to keep in mind that the fact that it's not in the interest of President Putin to basically cut entirely the pipeline to the Europe. Basically what they will uh, try to do is to create this narrative to strengthen the Europeans, to create this unity among the Europeans and for the Europeans basically uh, to decide that Maybe we should continue be uh, taking uh, Russian uh, gas because we don't have uh, mm -hmm. viable alternatives so far. So in, in this in this regard, I, I feel that um, the Russians are playing like a regional power game. They want to be a great power, but they are playing a regional power game because they don't have any more the influence or the soft power in Europe. Mm -hmm. They are trying to basically gain some allies in uh, Central Eastern Asia. And those alliances are mostly based on common interest. But we also, because my, my colleague mentioned Turkey, we also have to keep in mind that Turkey is a NATO member state and Turkey has different security interests, those of Russia. And Throughout the history, um, what was at that point the terrorist empire fought against the Ottoman Empire among the same area which they considered their own sphere of influence. So we have Understood. to understand that mm -hmm. this relationship between Turkey and uh, Russia is basically based on a specific common interest in some minimal fields. It's not a general um, binding relationship. Hmm, quite interesting. Now, uh, let's tackle another point. During the Tehran summit, uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed on Tuesday 
Ukraine refused to respect agreements that had been virtually reached during talks in Turkey in March. Talks in Iran was a chance for Mr. Putin to deepen ties with regional leaders as part of Moscow's challenge to the United States and Europe amid its Green Deal campaign in Ukraine. The final result depends not on the mediators but on the desire of contracting parties to implement reached agreements. We are seeing today that Kiev's authorities do not have this desire. We will assist in the export of Ukrainian grain, but we proceed from the fact that all restrictions on the export of Russian grain will be lifted. We have reached a preliminary agreement on that with international organizations, which have taken the labor to turn it all into a package. No one, including our American partners, has objected so far. Let's see how it all evolves in the nearest time. The Jordani Putin is clearly saying that Ukraine didn't accept the peace negotiation and he kind of assuming that Zelensky is being controlled by other countries, in other words, UK, US. Is this true or he is only saying this because he refused to negotiate? And coming back to the point you have raised, why not other countries have done the same as Turkey is doing? Thank you for the question. This is very smart. Um, I believe that that's only Russian propaganda. You know, like uh, there is two sides in, in this war. One is Russian, one is Ukrainian, and both they have two propagandas. Um, I believe that in the end, the real peace deal between these two countries will be who has won on the field. You know, the the, the first country that will finish the ammunition will ask for peace. That's it. You know, like there is, uh, there is no other escape in this war. There is no other space for diplomatic stuff. Erdogan has done uh, <clears throat> a good job in trying to broker a uh, um, a ceasefire for moving out the grain from Ukraine. Obviously, it's not enough for the peace between the two countries. The peace between the two countries will arrive when one of them will finish the ammunition. That's it. Mm -hmm. Why any other countries didn't do like Turkey? Because Turkey is Turkey. Because uh, imagine if Germany has done it, what would have happened? The fact is that uh, uh, I live in Italy, no? For example, if Italy would have done like Turkey, you would have all the European partners yelling, oh, like Italy is leaving the Western Front in order to try to broker a peace deal between the two countries. We need to stand with Ukraine. This is what would have happened with Italy. But Turkey is occupying a special place because Turkey is a bridge between the West and the East, but still part of NATO, and North Africa, but still part of NATO. So it's perceived as, uh, okay, you know, you are still part of NATO, but we, we can use you as a backdoor for dirty jobs uh, in Middle East or in the Slavic area. So that's why they are using Turkey to do this job. And that's why you don't have any Western leaders uh, um, which is lamenting about the role of Turkey trying to broker a deal between Ukraine and Russia. This is the reason. It would have been politically impossible for Italy. It would have been politically impossible for Germany. Germany has tried to do it. He was, they were lambasted. Italy has tried shortly to do something. It was lambasted. The only serious country that can do it, that has, you know, dubious moral standing, it's Turkey. Mm -hmm. Because it's part of NATO, part of the West, but still, you know, part of the East. Understood. And not a full democratic country. Thank you ever so much. Uh, coming to you, Mrs. Ionilla, talking about the gas deliveries, Biden main, Biden's main tour uh, in uh, his uh, last uh, in the Middle East is to convey Saudi Arabia of the need to increase global oil supplies to ease the energy crisis sparked by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and to reinforce U.S. position in the region. So, to this point, do you think U.S., with its strong ties with the Zionist entity, will stop the influence of China in the Middle East? 
and will ensure another alternatives through Saudi Arabia, though they, they have offers nothing extra. I'm not an expert on the Middle East, so I will uh, I will not answer that question because it's not in my area of expertise. Quite understood, quite understood. No need to answer uh, something that you don't have an idea about it. But now let's come back to Europe. Russian President Vladimir Putin is offering Ukraine a fast track of citizenship in May. So he is asking them to join to Russia and he is giving passports to Ukrainian. Do you think that Ukrainian citizens will lose their loyalty to their country and accept the offer? So, uh, if this question is for me, okay, I will, I will answer this. Um, so, uh, uh, what we are seeing uh, to, uh, today, so what you mentioned at the beginning of uh, the, the show, the fact that we see that in the uh, Russian uh, occupied territories where uh, Moscow installed its authorities, we see this tendency to annex those territories. In, in order to do that, basically they started to distribute the Russian uh, 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 passport to mm -hmm. the people living there, to the Ukrainians living there. They are also starting to include the uh, Russian currency, the ruble, and they are also planning to start to introduce the Russian Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. What uh, Basically, this is uh, something uh, um, that we also saw in 2014 after the Crimean annexation. It's part of the Russian uh, mm -hmm. annexation of those territories which they occupied with the idea that in a couple of months they will uh, create another referendum and say that uh, it was a... Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mrs. Ionella. I'm sorry, Mrs. Ionelli, to cut your train of thought. We have reached the limit of our time. Uh, Mr. Giordano from Italy, Mrs. Ionella from Brussels, Belgium, thank you ever so much for accepting the invitation to participate with us. Thank you, dear viewers, for keeping it here with us on L24 News. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.